Unions are a part of the employment landscape in Canada. Membership as a percentage of the workforce may have declined over the years, but that doesn't mean unions are dormant. They continue to be active and aggressive in courting new members. Canadian HR Reporters Roundtable on Labour Relations probed a number of issues around working with unions, including tactics for smooth relations, what employers can do during an organizing campaign, and what mistakes companies often make when a union first knocks on the door. It's already too late for many employers. Uh, the, you, can't, uh, you can't start uh, having a non-union workforce when the union shows up to try to organize your employees. You have to uh, start having a non-union workforce from the moment you decide to be a business that employs people. And the, uh, the only effective way in my 30 years of doing this stuff that I've seen an employer uh, defeat, and I don't even like the negative words, defeat a union organizing campaign, so let's just say remain a non-union workplace, that is a workplace where the workers uh, do not choose to be represented by a trade union. And the only effective way of doing that is by having uh, excellent human resources policies and practices and by doing the kinds of things that unions would come to the workplace saying they could help the workers achieve. So if you already have a workplace that has fair and transparent wages, that has opportunity for uh, development within the workplace, that has uh, excellent uh, health and safety policies, uh, that has a welcoming environment for uh, women, for visible minorities, for persons with disabilities, if that's the workplace you're operating, and then your chances of uh, remaining a non-union workplace are significantly higher. They're, to use your term in a different way, there are no guarantees, uh, but they're significantly higher than if you're, uh, if you're operating a workplace that does not uh, uh, actually practice those values. And by the way, I would also say that it's not a lip service thing. It's day in, day out, uh, uh, grinding away at trying to do the right things uh, uh, every day with all of your workers in, in, in every way you possibly can. That's the only way I've ever seen it succeed. But once the union drive starts, employers need to be careful in how they react. The, the big thing is overreaction. The, uh, um, the fact of the matter is that uh, um, most businesses, unless they're inherently unhealthy, will survive a union organizing campaign whether or not the union is successful. If the union is successful, you are in a transformed workplace. You're now dealing with a third party, uh, but there's no reason why your workplace cannot continue to succeed. In fact, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Bill would say it may, it may even succeed much better. And I've seen workplaces where they actually are better off once a union arrives because they get themselves organized for the first time. They start to pay properly. They start to have effective HR policies for the first time. Uh, and they, they actually are better off, not necessarily because uh, of the union uh, being a cooperative partner, but because the system that they're now into forces them to do the kinds of things they ought to have already been doing. So I would say that's the big thing is overreacting both in the short term and in the longer term. Uh, when I get contacted by an employer that tells me there's a trade union uh, uh, there and they ask me to advise uh, uh, the management team as to what to do, uh, and what I tell them is uh, everybody relax. Uh, get out on the floor if it's a plant or get out in the office if it's a uh, uh, if it's a white collar setting or out in the hospital or the nursing home or wherever they uh, they may be communicate with your employees make sure that uh, that they know that it's business as usual uh, uh, everybody calm down think through what you want to do think through why a union would be attractive or not attractive to you uh, and make a good informed decision and and that would be the last point I would make Employers, I, I implore them every time, trust your employees. Trust your employees to make the right decision, uh, which hopefully, if you're the employer, will be, I'm sorry about this bill, but hopefully will be a decision to not support the trade union. Uh, um, but if you don't trust your employees, if you treat them uh, uh, paternalistically like little children who need to be told exactly what to do, then they are going to rebel like little children often do and probably do the opposite of what you want them to do. So ultimately, you have to communicate with your employees and trust them to, uh, to make their own informed decision and make a good decision at the end of the day. Uniforce Bill Murnahan echoed that point, stressing the decision to have a union or not does not rest in an employer's hands. I, I think because uh, I'm the only one here from a union, I, I think it's important to say that the choice about joining a union rests entirely 100% with the employees. 
Um, and of course, employers will have their views about what they might want or not want, but legally, morally, uh, this is the question of employees to choose their representation or not. I know you, everyone knows that, but, but it sometimes gets forgotten in human resources, uh, labor relations, literature, and so on, that, that there's a, an active role for the employer in deciding whether or not there should be a union in the workplace or not. They may have their views, but I'll just put that uh, out there. Um, and. Uh, Excellence in human resources, of course, you can do all the things inside of a workplace to be an excellent employer, um, but at times I think workers legitimately want a different form of representation, uh, and sometimes it's just as clear as, as having a balance of power. Uh, it's great to have a great HR mm -hmm. system, but mm -hmm. at times you're dealing with huge corporations that have tremendous power. Uh, you see it in action, you see it uh, in terms of jobs coming or going and investments in your future, and you want to have some different system and people do like democracy, and I think essentially, I, I know, uh, as Jamie has mentioned, I think people want fairness in the workplace. There's a lot of different ways to do that, and, and unions are, are, are key to it. Uh, some employers bring that fairness through other means, um, and, you know, that's a good thing. But while the decision to join a union is up to workers, employers don't have to stay silent during an organizing campaign. Uh, the real issue uh, is, is the one you first touched on, and that is uh, what is the extent of the employer's freedom of speech during, a, uh, uh, during an organizing campaign, and especially in that concentrated period. We have a week in Ontario between the point of application and the, uh, and the timing of the representation vote, uh, and what is an employer's uh, right of free speech. And it's actually much broader than most employers understand, because the potential for automatic certification in Ontario now is very, very limited. Uh, and as long as you stay away from the major taboo subject, which you ought to stay away from because it's a, it's a red herring and it's a, it's a false threat, as long as you stay away from the job security issue, uh, you get unionized, we're going to shut the plant down and move to Michigan. There you go, there's my Michigan reference, uh, uh, which, is, which is grotesque, it's un-Canadian and, uh, and it's a lie, uh, then, uh, then you should be fine. So uh, you have uh, reasonably broad free speech as an employer, very, very rare that you're going to face an automatic, uh, uh, an automatic uh, uh, certificate issue. Uh, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, from that standpoint, I think employers can feel relatively comfortable uh, in Ontario in an organizing campaign if they get half-decent advice on, uh, on what kind of communications are appropriate to their employees. If a union does form in your workplace, there are a number of tactics employers can adopt to ensure a smooth relationship. I'd say rule one is talking a lot and constantly. Don't wait for bargaining. Uh, I think that when you arrive at the bargaining table, if that's the first time somebody sees an issue, then you've done yourself and the union and the membership and the employees a disservice. Uh, if you have an issue, talk every day about it. Uh, listen as much as you talk, maybe even more, um, to what's driving their issues and, and then try to look for some common ground. You won't always agree. Heck, we don't always agree as management on, on courses of action. I know inside unions they don't always agree on courses of action because there's a plethora of opinions, and that's good and it's healthy. But if you listen to people's approaches, you try to take them into consideration in your decision-making, you involve people in decision-making, you go a long way. And, uh, and also accept that with all your unions at all the time, you won't all have the same relationship. That sometimes in the same workplace, you'll have, you know, there'll be three or four unions and for some reason it's clicking and there'll be one for some reason it's not clicking. It might be the dynamics between the two parties, it might be the dynamics inside the parties. Uh, Walter McCurzy did a nice study of that a long time ago. But but you always got to work forward on it and I think that's that's the key. Um, and, and communicate on many levels. It's just not top to top, it's not just bottom to bottom, it's all levels. And it's not just at those levels, it's this level, top of that level, mm -hmm. uh, in the unions, in the management and having very strong sustainable, productive relationships. Because I agree with <clears throat> everything that's been said in terms of uh, in, in terms of how you operate an effective uh, unionized workplace, but I think to a certain extent we also have to go back to the basics of uh, uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about a unionized workplace and that starts with the fundamental concept of management rights. Uh, and and it's, a, it's an understanding of what the roles of the different players are in the workplace. And the way a workplace operates in Canada is there's this fundamental concept called management rights in which the employer can do whatever it thinks it needs to do to achieve the objective, objectives of its organization 
subject to, obviously, legislation and whatever the economic pressures are, but particularly in a unionized workplace, subject to the collectively bargained terms and conditions that restrict management rights, uh, and, and they restrict them either by preventing management from doing certain things or by having management pay a premium for doing certain things, like overtime or having people work on, uh, uh, on holidays or that kind of thing. And, and if employers remember uh, the roles of the different players in the workplace, and don't get confused about that. The employer's job is to manage the workplace, and they have to recognize that the union's job is to represent the interests of the workers in enforcing the terms and conditions uh, that they've collectively bargained with the employer, and also infor enforcing those statutory measures like human rights, health and safety, and other legislative measures that impact on the workplace in protecting the workers' rights. That's what the different roles are. And if you remember those roles, and don't get those roles confused, and remember what the union's job is, and don't get offended when the union does its job uh, of representing the workers that it's been, it's been chosen to represent, uh, then you're all going to get along much better, especially if you practice, I think, this, this other fundamental point of day-to-day -day, uh, communication, early dispute resolution, and uh, all of those other good ideas that, that you've heard from the other panelists. I think on top of the management rights, I don't know if like to use that phrase much, although it exists. I like, I like it. <laughs> I, I start with do the right thing, because there's a lot of stuff management can do that shouldn't do. Right. You know, and that creates a lot of the harm. So I can do this, watch me do it. When we all know deep inside that we did the wrong thing. So start with do the right thing, talk a lot, listen a lot. Um, the third party, I think, has a role. I think you got to be careful. There's a lot of studies done on, you know, that's a very addictive process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, heck, we all have relationships and, you know, we have to work them out yeah. Yeah. for the, you know, the fights and the, you know, heck, if, if you called somebody into your relationship, your, your spouse or your significant other every time you got into dispute, <laughs> that'd be a difficult way to, to live. I think if you go back to the fundamentals, what are we trying to achieve and, and, and work along that, that line. If I could offer in uh, to this perspective as well, I think I'd echo what many people have said. Uh, you know, uh, talking, discussion, communications are absolutely essential. People are complicated. Those of us in human resources, uh, labor relations field, people are going to do stupid things. We're going to have all sorts of problems on all sides. This is it. Uh, where in the best relationships, uh, I think you could characterize the role of the union in that, is that the collective bargaining process and the union process organizes that discussion in a workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, it organizes the problems into a structure and into a system that you can actually get to those issues um, and use all those mechanisms. And in terms of, you know, I don't know, advice to employers is use them all. Set up your labor management committee, set up your, and meet, and don't just meet because you feel like you have to. Uh, but use that dialogue and have those relationships. Uh, on another point, uh, you know, share information. Some of the most sophisticated uh, and I think good labor relations we've got with some major employers, you know, our, our, our folks are almost telling me, okay, no more presentations on, the, on, on how the company's doing and where it's headed, even though they want to know. Um, but, and again, it has to be truthful, not just one set of charts for the workers and one for the, for the stockholders. Uh, we need the same set. And I find, the, for a variety of reasons, I'm sure others would say that some of the workplace union leaders have an excellent analysis and understanding of what is happening inside their employer's firm, where it's heading. Some have no clue. Some managers have no clue. Uh, that's fair. But you're, you'll find some really good insight uh, among the people who spent 30 years in the workplace. And they might have seen, you know, the company name change five times and five presidents come and go. And they understand what they're doing. So uh, use that use those relationships and share that information I think is is central and you get when you come to difficult situations and hard choices people understand a bit better they still have to represent we still have to represent our members and their interests but but there's a different understanding and if the organization is going to survive past a hard time having dealt with that hard time in a sophisticated way uh, makes it much better when you come out of it if we're talking about the future of trade unions in the private sector the message I leave with Bill, I'd implore him, and uh, he probably knows this, he doesn't need me to tell him, but uh, all of the information you get, if you have that kind of uh, uh, forward-thinking employer that's going to give you the same charts as the shareholders get, then then the union movement has to go away from sort of that traditional, we're going to do it this way, whether it's your workplace here or this workplace over here, and they've got to move towards 
cooperative uh, solution finding for that particular business that breaks through some of the uh, some of the old models and starts to find new solutions to problems that are facing uh, the people around the table whether you're a worker or management plant clo I often say if the plant closes I lose the client my management side loses their job and so do the people on the other side of the table so none of us are going to win so we got to figure this out and too often the thing doesn't get figured out uh, and, and so you get uh, you get uh, uh, businesses leaving, jobs being lost because people have not been able to take the information that's there and figure out what the uh, what the solution is for that particular uh, place of work.